shut up, I hand over to Ben. And to everyone, enjoy the show. <laughs> okay, thanks, Marcus. Uh, yeah, hi, everyone. Greetings uh, from Berlin. Um, I have also two cats in the flat. So if you, have, if you hear weird sounds in the background, or they might even show up in the picture, uh, you have been warned. Um, yeah, the topic of today is uh, Ethereum, the world computer, block number four. And um, what's going to happen today? Uh, first, I'll start off with an analogy, how spool knitting can be considered to be like blockchain. Then um, I have planned four uh, live demos throughout the um, three hours, um, one with your participation. There will be one Miro session, and the rest is just me presenting slides, basically. All right, let's start with a blockchain analogy. I hope um, it's, it was a bit hard to calibrate the level because I heard, I mean, all of you heard blockchain by now, but for some of you, this will be a bit too, let's say, dumbed down, uh, but it, it's hopefully still interesting. Um, so the story goes as such. You have a, a ledger like this book in front of you where you keep track of your own expenses. Um, but you're starting to get worried that someone steals that book and you don't have these numbers anymore. So what do you do? Just follow me along. It might not be, seem super rational, but you decide to come up with a way to encode this information in strings, in ropes. If some of you have seen the movie C on um, Apple TV, there they figured out a way to encode um, written information in knots, in strings. So basically you figured out how to put this secret information in strings. And then the next step, obviously, is um, to put it into a spool knitting device or Strickliesel in German. That looks like this. And um, you basically, this is how you, it goes up on here and then you, you form this thicker ropes out of it. And this is how you encode your information. But then you, you get worried and be like, well, this is still not secure enough. Let's have a... Uh, um, six of them simultaneously. And as soon as they are not ac exactly the same, there's something wrong here. Yeah, okay. But now that you have that really nice system, you're getting uh, an idea. What about if I actually give back uh, right, the right to write on this blockchain to other people? But um, I don't need their real identity. I just need some identity. That's why there's the mask uh, icon. So the first idea, um, access to um, people with an account. The second idea is to put code on uh, these ropes that you're putting in there, executable code. That's your second idea to put on. Um, the problem is if you have a whole range of these um, strict diesel out there, how can you prevent from uh, infinity loops to occur? Because if anyone with access can cause this code to run, um, how does it ever stop? And the solution, as we will hear later, is um, gas fees. All right. So um, where do we start here? Yeah, basically, so in the analogy up here, that's the block. And then all of it is the chain. Um, we have transactions as the string. The Strickliesel is a node in a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, the person or actor putting that into the blockchain is called a miner and the process of doing so is called mining. And um, we have the concept of transaction fees. Furthermore, we have the concept of accounts and smart contracts that get deployed, oops, uh, that get deployed uh, onto this blockchain. So yeah, that's basically what I wanted to sort of tease out of that analogy and I hope it's useful to some. Um, for me, it was a bit like mentally nice to have, uh, to have that as an image to, to, to understand what, what blockchain is. Um, and these, these uh, concepts, terms, they will come up now throughout the, throughout the remaining time. Okay, um, now let's talk a bit more what Ethereum is from, uh, from the famous book, Mastering Ethereum. First, from a computer science perspective, 
Ethereum is a deterministic but practically unbounded state machine consisting of a globally accessible singleton state and a virtual machine that applies changes to that state. Fair enough, let's hear the practical perspective. Ethereum is an open source, globally decentralized computing infrastructure that executes programs called smart contracts. It uses a blockchain to synchronize and store the system's state changes along with a cryptocurrency called Ether to meter and constrain execution resource costs. And then finally, the marketing perspective. The Ethereum platform enables developers to build powerful decentralized applications with built-in economic functions while providing high availability, auditability, transparency, and neutrality. It also reduces or eliminates censorship and reduces certain counterparty risks. So these were all um, quotes from this um, book. Then, um, Let's take a brief sort of bird view of the history of Ethereum, like super brief. It was proposed in late 2013 by Vitalik Buterin, a cryptocurrency researcher and programmer. Uh, a major event was in 2016. There was a $50 million theft happening, which resulted in Ethereum splitting into two separate blockchains, so so-called fork. Um, the sort of what we now call Ethereum is the version with the theft reversed. And the original chain continued as Ethereum Classic. Yeah, it operates with proof of work. Um, just like on Bitcoin, miners are competing to solve mathematical puzzles. And the big thing up on the Ethereum horizon is Ethereum 2.0, um, where they transition from a proof of work to a proof of stake, um, which will increase uh, transaction throughput and um, a whole lot of other improvements. Okay. Um, what Ethereum is also uh, is, is a cryptocurrency. Just like Bitcoin, you can invest in it, you can store your assets in it, you can um, exchange it for euros back into euros. Um, these are screenshots from yesterday from, from Coinbase. Um, you can see that oh, since the start, how the, how the curve basically involved currently, or yesterday, it was 311 euros. Uh, one Ether is worth 311 euros. Uh, with an increase of uh, almost 12,000% from the beginning. And if you look at the curve over just one year, you can also see there were some wild fluctuations this year, uh, but right now we're sort of definitely higher than the average of, uh, of the year. Okay. Uh, another info I wanna throw in at this point before we go into the um, demos and interactive things. Um, there's a few Ethereum test networks out there for developer to try out their things before they move on the so-called mainnet because on mainnet, the ether is worth real money. You have to pay for it um, with fiat currency. Um, the four biggest Ethereum test networks are Robsten, which is proof of work with a block time of 30 seconds. Coven, also proof of work with a block time of four seconds. Rinkeby with proof of authority. And the newest kid in town is Gurley with uh, proof of authority also. And um, yeah, some of them have logos, uh, others don't. And now I would already like to move into the first uh, interactive part, the Miro session on Bitcoin versus Ethereum. Uh, you all should have the Miro link through the Edo app or through the email from, from Marcus. Um, please open that. And then the task will be to collect uh, data points um, to compare Ethereum and Bitcoin. Um, these instructions are also on the Miro board. The copy are posted in the respective color and then either create a concrete data point or find attributes that um, connect them. For instance, the same category. I will um, give an example. So let's switch to Miro. Nice to see some cursors going crazy. Perfect. Okay, so Ethereum has exactly <laughs> Ethereum has the, this color, Bitcoin has this color, and then the attributes have this color. And what do I mean by this? Basically, um, for um, the next uh, seven minutes, I would like you to like copy a post-it like this, and then write something like um, full during complete language, and then one like this and be like um, basic scripting language. 
And then either you yourself, because you have in mind what's the, the, the connection between them or someone else can grab a sort of meta post-it or even what, what's the attribute here? Basically, the question is of smart contracts. And then in that way, this post-it connects uh, these two. Another way of doing that would be with um, uh, making a link like this. Um, but basically that's the idea that you can operate on either you just provide these sort of data points, these sort of facts um, and slash or you, um, you connect different post-its and be like, this is actually all in the same category. All right, I hope that made sense. Um, I will start a timer here and please go ahead. Perfect, cool. Thank you very much for participating, everyone. And then I would jump back into the presentation. Um, and I do have a slide exactly on that topic because I did also my homework on this. So the, um, yeah, as I just said, uh, the block time on Ethereum is 10 to 19 seconds, whereas it's 10 minutes on Bitcoin. Um, the mining rate on Ether is usually at a consistent rate, whereas on Bitcoin it halves every four years. The um, transaction fees, the amount of how much you have to pay, we will also have a little slide on that later, differs on Ethereum by computational complexity, bandwidth use and storage needs. And on Bitcoin, it's only related to how big your transaction size, uh, transaction is in terms of bytes. Then the sort of basic record keeping model of these two are also different in a sense that Ethereum uses an account balance model. So it's more interested in storing total sums, whereas uh, Bitcoin uses what's called UTXO, unspent transaction output model, where it's adding up paper bills to know how much you own. You basically have to look in your wallet and be like, okay, we're adding all of this up. This is how much I have. And um, yeah, this was my initial example. The um, Ethereum has a Turing complete language for their smart contracts and Bitcoin has very rudimentary Turing incomplete um, script language. All right, with that, I would go into the first demo on the topic of account. That's why I used the theater uh, emoji again to sort of relate back to the analogy. Um, what do we mean with account on Ethereum? And hopefully while I um, present, it also makes sense why I refer to accountability on that. And Let's go here. What I'm using for this is a tool that Austin Griffith um, built, uh, a sort of a maker in the space. He, he makes a lot of nice uh, Ethereum tools. And we start with, I have a little um, cheat sheet here, a script kind of, start by a text. Hello world. And what we do now, you also heard about hash in uh, previous um, sessions, what a hash does. What a hashing function does is creating the a same length strength, string independent of what you put in. So even if I put in nothing, we have a string of that length, of this length. And if I put something in here, the hash changes, but not the length of it. That's very important. And what's also important, if you get that hash from someone, it's nearly impossible to find out what the original text was. But in the other direction is very easy. The hashing function itself is just some math, uh, but the other direction must be super hard. Um, okay, let's pick. Um, Um, now, what I want is a key pair component and a button to trigger it. I'm not going to go into too much detail what happens behind the scenes. We're just going to accept these sort of modules as such. Um, they would otherwise go a bit too much into detail. And um, basically, so. What this component does is whenever I click here, it generates a new key pair, private and public key pair. 
Um, you might have heard of it in connection to uh, encrypting your emails. And that I also want to just quickly um, demonstrate just what that looks like. Um, decrypt text. Just have to wire it up. Um, this is our input text. Then the encrypted text will be shown here. And now we grab the, yeah, first, basically, if I want to send Marcus an encrypted email, I need to use his public key, which he's gladly shares online, um, to encrypt the message. And then I'm basically sending him this. And then to decrypt it, only he has, hopefully only he has the private matching key. And then he only he can uh, decrypt the message. So when I change the text, you can see that the original and the decrypted must, of course, be the same. Um, but um, yeah, the hash is still active here, and the the encrypted text changes. Just um, to see how that how that plays together. Also, when I generate a new key pair, you can see that the encrypted text also changes. Okay, but. Um, I'm going to delete some of the components because moving forward, we will not need this stuff anymore. And also here, um, I'm mostly interested in the address because what a key pair does besides the private and public key, it also generates an address, which is my identity on the blockchain. The address is the most important part. Um, another way to display it would be as QR code like this. And every time I click here, it's generating a new address. And in a moment, I will prove to you that this is like immediately functionable and workable. I can use this on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, okay, but the problem is now I could um, note down the private and public key and try to restore it from there. But there's a much more convenient way that the space has sort of agreed on as a standard and that's called a uh, mnemonic. Um, I will cut this connection and instead generate new mnemonics. Text area. Well, what a mnemonic is, um, is 12 words, 12 English words um, from a catalog of I think 2000 plus something. Uh, words. So it's standardized. You cannot just put any words in there. And, and they basically get with each time I click, they get randomized. And from um, this mnemonic, you're highly encouraged to write down on a piece of paper, never store it anywhere. Um, kind of that's what when you set up your MetaMask, what you're being um, told you should do with it. Um, and from this mnemonic, we can derive a private key. And then through some also very standardized math with entropy functions and whatnot. From that private key, you can then generate private key, which is like the same, a public key and an address. So the nice thing is here that basically the only thing you have to remember is the mnemonic because it will help you um, get into your account. Um, okay, now I want to show you that this is, um, even so it's just fun and games here to click around, this is actually immediately ac actionable. And for that, I will um, create, I will not use mainnet, I will use Rinkeby. And I need that address. And I need to, from way, this is just a sort of conversion of numbers to something that's readable. Um, bam. Okay, and as you can see, I will also need a new button to trigger the check. As you can see on this address I just generated, there's no, um, there's no ether, it's zero. But if I go ahead now, copy this and, uh, one second, the uh, zoom thing is in the way. And now with my sort of Rinkeby rich account here, I have 150 Rinkeby ether here that are unfortunately not worth anything. Um, I'm gonna send a little bit of ether um, to that address. We will talk later about transaction fee, what I just put in there. Send it off. And now this is basically on the way. While that is on the way, um, I will also prove to you that I can use this mnemonic to basically log into 
um, a MetaMask account. This password here is just to locally protect my MetaMask. The, the, the key to restoring your Ethereum account is uh, literally only the, the mnemonic or also called wallet seed here. And as you can see, it already arrived. See, so I locked into my account and my funds are there. That also means if I click here, it should show up. Yeah, it's there. So from this account that I just randomly generated, there are literally funds now on it. And let me just um, show you because I'm very greedy. I'm going to send it back. I want this back. Maximum amount. Speed it up a bit. Oh, okay. Or not. One second. Um, so, okay. This is on the way back now. And um, now I'm, I'm going to show you on Etherscan. The, this is a tool to um, scan anything that's happened on the Ethereum mainnet or any of the test nets. And here I'm pasting in that address. And you can see a minute ago, um, this address received that amount of Ether. And in a bit, the sort of outgoing um, transaction should also show up here. But you can see this is basically for real. It's going to stay, this transaction is going to stay on Rinkeby for eternity unless it gets shut down or whatever happens to, to test nets. Um, yeah, here we see it's out. So this, um, this, yeah, it's back to zero. And also to be a bit more dramatic, I'm going to uh, remove MetaMask. So basically, I'm not logged into MetaMask anymore. And now I will click on generate new, boom. And unless someone of you made a screenshot, I can never ever log back into that account that I just created and send money to and back because I don't have the mnemonic anymore. And I also uninstalled MetaMask in that other browser. So it's literally, there's no force on earth that could help me get back into that account. Just to sort of show you the, 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 the drama of this basically. Okay, good. That was, um, that was the first demo. I can close this. Um, ah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, a quick recap. Basically, um, I put this into, into a repository on future ICT, so style. The link, this link leads directly to a fully built, um, to basically what I just did here. And um, it's also saved as um, web log in here. And the second demo is also in here. So if you want to um, grab that repo, that's going to be useful. Um, nice. That's good to hear. I think Marcus, you started this, uh, Paul. Cool, nice. I didn't know Zoom can do polls. Okay, let's. I also didn't. I just spontaneously tried it out. I hope it's okay. Nice. I won't sure. defer more. <laughs> no, it's cool. Um, this one was stopped. Okay, as a recap, um, we created an account, which means basically following a, a bunch of standardized math from a mnemonic to a public uh, key, private key, and an address. Um, also, um, we've seen that the hash is basically something that maps data of arbitrary size to fixed size values. We have seen that the key pair generates private and public key and an address and optionally does this from an existing private key. And that's basically the trick we use from the mnemonic because the mnemonic creates the private key, uh, which is a seed phrase to derive a private key from. Exactly. Um, the address is the identity on the blockchain and it's often visualized as icon or a QR code. And uh, transaction fees uh, have two fields that you have to fill out, the gas price and the gas limit, which um, we will get to more later. And so far, uh, boringly, we only used Ethereum in sort of Bitcoin style to send um, the native cryptocurrency Ether around. Um, what we should definitely do is interact with smart contracts to really see what Ethereum is, um, is all about. Um, but before we do that, a bit more sort of like um, lecture style input um, to coming back to what, what, what teasing out from that um, analogy, the um, Strickliesel um, in the nodes in a peer-to-peer -peer network. 
uh, on ethernodes.org, you can see how many nodes are currently running to keep up the Ethereum mainnet, which was um, a few days ago when I took the screenshot a bit over 8,000 nodes. And these nodes uh, are written in a few different uh, competing frameworks. Uh, the most widespread is uh, Geth and then um, Nethermind, Parity, um, but they basically all do the same. So they have to do the same thing standardized, but you can implement them in different ways. And um, yeah, what um, sort of cons consumer facing is the most spread is Infura. So if I connect to MetaMask, I'm basically talking to Infura, which is hosted on Amazon servers. So the whole aspect of decentralized is a bit on its head, but that's a philosophical discussion on itself, but it's very user-friendly to just Infura to connect, use Infura to connect to the uh, Ethereum network because most people don't want to run their own node. But if you do, um, you're more than welcome. For instance, you could use um, hardware like uh, Avado that uh, you basically buy and then you run your own node. Or what we did, um, we got a computer from uh, the ETH uh, IT, and this is uh, it's standing in the in the server room, and we're running um, D app node software on it. And it um, yeah, it's running the Ethereum mainnet and the Rinkeby network. Okay, okay, guess. Let's talk about guess. Um, if you remember from me sending this stuff in, in MetaMask, there were these two mysterious numbers down there where I tried to fiddle with and then it, 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 it broke in one case. Um, let's see if we can try to understand that. So gas in general refers to the unit that measures the amount of computational effort required to execute an operation on Ethereum, right? So any operation on Ethereum, you're basically activating this world computer, it's computational effort and you need to pay for it in gas. Um, the more complex the contract and the more operations it performs, the more expensive it is to run it. So basically, um, the more you cause on this network, the, the more expensive it gets. Um, the sender of a transaction specifies how much they're willing to pay per unit of gas called the gas price, which is denoted in GWAI, uh, which is, um, so one ETH is 10 to the nine GWAI. And this is basically the, the, the field on the left. I'm in this case, I'm sort of willing to pay 51 GWAI for one unit of gas. And I didn't put this 51. This is just MetaMask recommending me something because MetaMask is monitoring the sort of, um, what's the term for it? Um, how much traffic is going on in the network and with with what price you would probably get your transaction through in a reasonable time so this is kind of a suggested number and then you can change it you can you can raise it to get it through faster or you can lower it and just wait until it gets through and then the transaction cost is just the gas consumed by your operation multiplied by the gas price you were willing to pay for a unit of gas and then the second number um is basically if your transaction becomes more expensive than what you said in the gas limit, it gets canceled. It doesn't get through. Um, yeah, and as I said, normally I would just rely on whatever MetaMask puts in there because yeah, congestion, that was the word I was looking for. It takes network congestion into uh, account. Okay, one more slide on the gas topic. Um, yeah, you can use something like uh, gas trackers. Um, Etherscan has one of their own. Basically, if I would move that slider up and down, um, it's increasing or decreasing the gas price I would be willing to pay. And then it gives me an estimate for how long I would wait, wait for my transaction, 45 seconds in that case. And if I remember correctly, when I put this all the way down, I had to wait like 20 minutes or something. Um, yeah, and then there is, because for Ethereum developers, of course, the question, why do my users have to pay for every transaction? That's really not what I want from my users experiencing um, my D app. Then there's a solution like Ethereum gas station networks where you can uh, basically make changes in your smart contracts and then have a dedicated account who pays for all the transactions running on it. And then you can have like, then you need to basically have a business model around it. Who's paying for that basically is a foundation or donation or whatever. And um, there's also, new networks coming up based on Ethereum that um, are trying to lower the, the gas fees even further. Um, but as a concept, it's really meaningful to, to um, avoid misuse and congestion on the network. 
And this is a movie I recommend watching. And I think we're also going to watch it together in one of the following um, lectures. Um, the dawn of the D apps, how D apps work in 2018. And I put it on this slide because it also has a lot of funny um, referrals to on um, the topic of gas fees, because it's something a bit um, cognitively heavy to, to, to get around. Okay, then a bit about smart contracts. Mark told me you, you heard about the concept before. So I will just um, give some notable examples of implementations of smart contracts. Um, Bitcoin, as we said, is a Turing incomplete script language. But you can do a, a few things with it, like make payment channels, escrows, time locks, and stuff like that. Um, but then um, Vitalik basically said, back then, that's not good enough. We need a full-blown programming language on this. And he, he created Ethereum, um, which is the most prominent smart contract framework. Um, Ripple was uh, developed, but it's halted since 2015. EOS IO. And uh, Tezos is worth mentioning as a blockchain platform, modifying its own set of rules with minimal disruption to the network through an on-chain governance model. Yeah, in any of these, we could go uh, much deeper. Um, okay, also you heard about minting before. So just uh, basically one paragraph, mining is the process. Uh, did I say minting? Sorry, mining. Mining is the process of creating a block of transactions to be added to the Ethereum blockchain. Miners essentially process pending transactions and are rewarded block rewards in the form of Ether, the Ethereum network's native currency for each block generated. Okay. And with that, we're already reaching the second demo, which is a deployment demo, um, where I will walk you through um, mini life deployment. Okay. Let me switch. Um, over to here. What I do need is Ganache. My um, Ganache is a tool that simulates an Ethereum blockchain locally. So that's really useful for, um, for developers um, like me. So I can just use this and it feels like a real blockchain, but it's much faster. I don't have to wait this 10 to 30 seconds for each trans transaction. Um, okay. So the first thing we do is we run um, truffle init. What I'm doing here is I'm walking the commits uh, forward in history to, to sort of show you what happened. The commits are already there, but I'm sort of cherry picking them over to give a bit of a demo feeling. So um, truffle init creates um, a contract migrations and a script how to deploy these contracts. I don't want to go into detail what this migration stuff is. That's something that Truffle needs for their own version keeping. Um, and But what is important, it creates a Truffle config file with um, a lot of things to configure regarding um, your setup. The only thing we do want to change here is um, this one. We want to activate the development network, the local one at port 7545, which is um, the one that Ganache exposes. Um, all right, then we create a demo contract. So this is, um, this is a, so a smart contract written in Solidity, the most widespread language. The, the other one would be Wiper, sort of Python-based, but Solidity is really um, the biggest out there. And um, for those of you who have seen um, code before, it, it looks quite sort of straightforward, right? You have a contract, you have a public integer variable called foo with a value, and then I have a setter. Basically, when I call this method and I give it a new value, this value um, will be set to that. Um, okay. So that's our super simple smart contract that we will be using. And what we need to do now is tell the script to deploy it. So um, the deployer will deploy the demo contract. Perfect. Um, next step. Um, next step is to compile these contracts. So let me see. Truffle compile. Um, yeah. That creates a build folder that I will just quickly ignore so it doesn't get into Git. Yeah, exactly. And in this build folder, we have the two contracts, migrations again, we don't want to um, get into it. Um, 
And this demo contract.json is now the direct result of running Truffle compile on my demo contract.sol file down here. And um, in this JSON, there's a lot of stuff in there, but the only two interesting things for us are the ABI because it's sort of the interface. It tells you or tells Truffle what is in this contract, right? So we have a variable called foo. We have um, a setter foo. So basically this describes the layout of the contract. How can we talk to it basically? And further down here, we see the bytecode field, which is when I run in the next step Truffle migrate, only this part is basically being thrown onto the blockchain because this one encodes what my contract does. So let's run um, this one here. If you look at the block 424, it should go up when I run Truffle and migrate. Now, basically, we're throwing these contracts uh, up on my local blockchain. And we see something changed here. Um, it did cost me a bit of ether, but probably too little for that number um, to change. OK, that contract is uh, deployed now on my local blockchain. Um, let's see. Yeah, now we want to interact with it. So, and first with the command line before I build a sort of mini website that does it. Um, Truffle console. And then I do demo contract, deploy it. It's the syntax of a so-called promise. So once you have the uh, contract, then do this. And we can see we get the value of foo, which is uh, three. When, if I would uh, call the setter now instead, we can see I changed it to two. So um, that's basically all there is to interacting with a smart contract um, via command line. I just need to know the syntax basically and then I can go ahead. I could, um, it's literally that simple to do like this, network Rinkeby, and then I would be on Rinkeby with my Truffle console and I could interact with the contracts there. Um, of course, I can only call their sort of method names if I have the ABI available. Otherwise, um, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just operating blind basically. Um, There's okay. a question in the chat, Ben. Uh, okay. Interacting costs. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that's on some slide later. Basically, reading is for free, and you can read anything you want from the blockchain for free. But as soon as you make changes to the blockchain, as soon as you write something, you have to pay for it. And also, me deploying the smart contract just now when I ran Truffle Migrate, that also costed me. And uh, later, we will see the Fin4 project, um, which is quite a sort of has a lot of contracts by now and it's really expensive to deploy. We calculated it would be like almost a thousand dollars if we would do it on mainnet. So these are really something to, to consider when it's about the business model of what you're doing. Um, uh, I have not interacted with the public live global Ethereum in my demo. Um, or which one do you mean? Um, so the the previous one on this ETH build, that was for real in Rinkeby, that was out there. But what I just did now here is only locally with my ganache thing. Uh, reading means what I did with the foo. So that was um, when I asked for the value of foo and I got back that it's three, um, that was reading. I didn't change the value on the contract. I just read it. Okay. Um... Now um, we want to take it to the next level and build a mini website for it. And by website, I really just mean a button, nothing else. But I basically want to show you the building blocks necessary to, um, let's see. Okay, see, that's my amazing website. It has, it has a button that does nothing at the moment, but they will change. Um, next step is that the button is doing something, namely printing hello world. Um, then the next step is to use jQuery, a sort of famous library for, for JavaScript in the browser 
to get that um, demo contract JSON where the API and the bytecode are in, if you remember. So if I run this now, yeah, I don't know why it does that. Um, yeah, okay, I run into a course. Um, what I need to do, um, did I put, yeah. I'm basically running a super tiny mini server uh, from Python. This comes for free with this command. And that just means that um, instead of literally opening that file in my browser, I can now go to localhost um, 8000 and it's serving me up files in that folder. Okay, and here we're printing out that JSON object, the demo contract dot um, JSON looks like this. Nice, let's um, see the next step. Um, yeah, sometimes the Zoom thing gets in the way. So, yeah, next step is I need the contract address to further uh, interact with it. And um, to do that, I will create a file called contract address. Um, let contract address. And where I get it from is basically I scroll back to where I deployed it, deploying demo contract, and there I have the contract address. Okay, now, yeah, here we have the address, perfect. Um, let's, yeah, you can't see why I'm doing that, but I have this um, zoom bar in the top, that's why I'm trying to battle with it. Um, So, yeah, next step, a uh, very important step. Now we're importing ethers.js. It's a kind of a famous um, library up and coming. The cool kids use it. Um, it's competing with web3.js, a sort of really big library. Um, and ethers.js, we're importing like this. And um, we're creating a provider, it's called, based on our local host. So this is connecting to Ganache, basically. And then it's creating a contract based on the contract address we're importing, the ABI that I've shown you, and this provider object. And then we're printing the contract. Let's see how that looks like. So here we basically have the ethos.js contract object. So you can already see here, it knows already that we have a foo and a um, set foo method. Perfect, uh, next step. Um, next step is we can already call um, foo to get the value of it. Um, sorry, here. And the value is two. It's displayed in hex. That's why it um, looks weird like that. Um, okay. Um, call getter, trigger. Ah, yeah. Next step is just adding one line, but it's a very crucial line. Window Ethereum enable basically triggers MetaMask to ask um, this website um, wants to use me. Are you okay with that? And um, that looks like this basically. Um, blob, so I have to connect. And um, yeah, you didn't see it because I allowed it before, but basically it looks like this. Um, the site wants to connect with MetaMask. I'm allowing that. Okay, perfect. And MetaMask remembers that I gave permission. Um, so in the next step, um, I don't know if you've seen it. We made a tiny but important switch. Instead of using the provider with uh, a local host, we switched to window Ethereum. That's basically that object that I just unlocked here. So from now on, basically ethos.js is talking to MetaMask and then MetaMask has to deal with, with what blockchain we're talking. Um, but ethos.js from now on is talking to MetaMask. And um, so nothing should have changed now. And in MetaMask, again, I have my local Ganache selected. So I'm not in Rinkeby mainnet, I'm on that, on that local one. All right. 
Mm, yeah, next step is that we're moving into using the setter. So when I click that button, I'm gonna call set foo and I'm setting it to five. But for that, I don't know if you've seen it up here from provider, I need the get signer. And that is gonna trigger a meta mask and be like, hey, someone wants to actually interact on the blockchain in your name. Do you allow that? Do you allow me to use your private key to sign this transaction? So that's what's gonna happen when I click the button. MetaMask is popping up and be like, hey, stuff is going on. Um, do you allow that? And I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. And um, we will get absolutely no feedback because uh, I just called the setter without sort of waiting for the result. That's why um, I can just basically reload the page and see uh -huh, it went up to five. Um, that's a bit unsatisfying. That is a sort of just as a last step in this part of the demo. I'm expanding it a bit and I'm setting it to seven. And then as soon as the transaction object is there, I want to print it. And as soon as that transaction is completed, I also want to see the so-called received. So let's see. Okay. That's fast because it's all local. Transaction object and receive, uh, received object. So this I would use to sort of build my D app and be like, okay, it has gone through some button needs to change, something needs to happen. And it's on seven now. All right. Good. Then where's my, here. That was demo number two. It's also in that um, repository that I uh, mentioned earlier. As a recap, um, I wrote a contract in Solidity, compiled it to JSON, which is the most important things in there is ABI and bytecode with Truffle compile. Then I used Truffle migrate to deploy it locally to Ganache. Um, each contract has an address, just like any other accounts has, has an address. And then I used Truffle console to interact with it via command line. I built a mini HTML site that can um, do the same, but it uses ethos.js and MetaMask. And yeah, like referring to your question earlier, reading from the blockchain is for free, writing and deploying costs scarce and needs signed transactions. Um, just to see it in uh, one slide. So we have that demo contract and we talk to it with Truffle console but then we also talked to it with um, a mini HTML website and a button. So that was covered in the demo. And then basically you have all the building blocks to create a full blown D app. You just need a bit more time, maybe a few months to write out all the things, a lot of more smart contracts, a lot of more logic in the front end, but the building blocks are already in place, basically the communication um, pathways. And um, with that, I would um, release you into a 15 minute break. And then we see each other back at um, 5.30. Welcome back after the break. And I hand over to Ben. Thanks, Marcus. Okay. And we're starting with uh, the interactive uh, demo where I would invite everyone to try out um, our software, um, the, the code that we've been working on um, over the last uh, year the fin for explorer um, so what we will so we will all go to https.demo.fin4.net uh, and then i want i prepared a token for you called the sustao presence token that you can actually claim and i would invite you to do so to sort of basically prove that you're you're present here and um, the password i can already tell you the password super secret is i am here you will need this to to claim it um, and it's only claimable once. So once you have it, you cannot claim it again. And then I prepared just to sort of give a bit of an idea what we envision this platform to, to be used for or what it can be used for um, an ETH. And now in that case, I mean Zurich and not ETH Zurich, not <laughs> Ethereum, uh, the reusable cup token and a bike to uni token. And so I'm switching to demo.fin4.net and I would all invite you to do the same. Um, these people here gave me their address and I sent them two ether each. Um, 
if you haven't done so, you can you can do it now, or you will or, or just watch. It's also okay. So basically, this is um, our D app distributed app. It's a responsive design. So if I make it smaller or open it on mobile MetaMask, which also exists, it um, it adjusts the width. Um, the start page um, looks like this. Maybe a quick uh, walkthrough. We have um, yeah, we have an about page. Um, settings uh, where I can switch language at the moment, but there will be more features to switch here and some of the contract addresses. Um, a feature called user groups where I could create groups. So basically the scenario I'm running is the ETH Zurich decided to do sustainability tokens. So let's say the administration decided um, we want our students to um, to be more sustainable and we will encourage that through a token portfolio on fin4 that's the kind of scenario so i created this collection um, you would probably get this short link with a qr code it's everywhere in the university you imagine and you go there and be like oh cool let's see what kind of tokens they have and you see a reusable cup token and a bike to uni token and then you you would feel like okay i want to claim these because then i get something for free in the cafeteria or um, I don't know what I get, maybe, probably not an ECTS. I don't know what I can make possible. Um, and uh, the user groups feature, which I did not use now, I could like say five people from the administration, they wanna be in a group together and anyone in that group can administer the, the collection, for instance. Then, um, yeah, you can send messages to user at this point, not encrypted. So everything you send here will be fully visible on the blockchain forever transfer tokens, and the whole topic of collaterals, underlying sources of values, I would postpone to an input session uh, in one of the coming weeks. And the same also goes for token curation because it's a very interesting topic that deserves some space, but right now it would blow a bit out of proportion. Uh, this is called token curated registry where you curate um, tokens in a, in a list of official tokens. Um, yeah, here in the tokens view, you see um, all the tokens that are created, that are these ones so far. Um, this, I don't know, someone experimented, which is very nice and gave themselves a lot of supply. Um, so these are the two ETH one I made and the presence token. And let's just, um, if you all go to claim, either through this way or you go down here to claims and then they select the SUSDAO presence token. And the workflow is as such that you can also already do it on your machine. You, you submit a claim first and then MetaMask pops up. And then here we have the gas price stuff. And until a few weeks ago, MetaMask design was a bit different. And there was a button that just said, add a bit more gas fee for it to go faster. And I love that button because I didn't have to think about numbers. I was just like, yeah, I'll pay a bit more for it to be faster. But they changed it and now you have to think about it. And basically um, I'm multiplying this value by five. I'm saying I'm five times more um, happy to pay per unit of gas price. Um, so get it's a bit more expensive. And I'm submitting as a transaction. And you can see here it's, um, it's pending. You can also already do this on your own also. Okay, it's through. Um, and now we have uh, an open claim here for the presence token. And now I'm being asked to submit proof. Okay, I'm claiming it, but how can I prove um, that, oh, sorry, that I actually deserve this token. This one got verified automatically. I haven't claimed before, so I'm allowed to claim it once. And now I have to put in the password. Uh, I am here. Okay, let's see. All right, that went through. The proof got verified successfully. Um, it's showing up green here now. And on the main page, I have a SUSDAO presence token. And this is, um, this is mine now. I could send it to someone else. Um, I can, this is the detail view of a token. Here I can see it on Etherscan. There they have a token tracker. 
And I can see that already four of you successfully claimed it because there's four holders of this token. Um, here's, here's three though. Here I can also see how many. Yeah, and um, if I do it again, it should get automatically blocked. So, because um, I'm, I added that verifier that it's only claimable once, but I'll, I'll walk you through the, the, the token creation process in a bit. See, it got blocked because this condition is violated. Exactly. Um, so, I know that you heard a bit about um, token token design before. Um, let's see how that looks like in our token creation wizard. So um, let's say I do an ETH um, PDF instead of print. I don't know how, is that a super smart token? I don't know, but for the example, um, PDF. So, and the next step, I'm being asked a few questions that are quite fundamental to a token design. We will hear later a bit about the ERC-20 standard that this is built on. Basically, cap means that after a certain value, um, there can be not more of this token created. That's, uh, that's the maximum. Initial supply means how much of this do I want from the, be from the beginning? And uh, of course, if I'm the administration and say, I'm getting 10,000 of this myself first, that's a bit questionable because students should earn this and no one should just make themselves rich from the get-go. So with all of these design questions, you have to think about how, what does that do to um, users trusting your token design. If you uncheck this, it means no one can transfer this token to someone else. Is that, is that meaningful? Does that make sense? Maybe if it's something like a reputation token or something that's very personal, does not make sense to transfer, it could make sense. Burnable means interesting property that you can destroy your money. Basically, you can um, you can burn your token. Is that is there a use case for? Yes, maybe. For instance, let's say we collectively as ETH want to burn down 100 tons of CO2 per month, and we decide we do that through literally sort of burning that uh, amount um, on the token to represent what happened in the real world. Okay. Minting policy means the token is, if it's not mintable, um, there cannot be created more of it. Then the only way there can be circulation is that because I gave it an initial supply and then this can circulate. But the default workflow that we decided to use for, for the Fin4 um, ecosystem is that tokens get minted through positive actions in the real world. So I use a reusable cup, uh, I clean up trash, I do something good for my neighbor, and uh, I'm proving that I did that. And then I'm getting a token minted, it's called. So it's confusing mining and minting. Minting is literally just um, the balance on that token for my address goes up. That is what minting means. Um, I can decide how much I get per claim or if the user decides themselves. So for a time banking scenario, if it's 120 minutes or something, you can put it in yourself. And here we come to the verifiers. Verifier, this is where I earlier selected this one, claimable only one times per user, or I can allow it only certain groups to claim it or block certain groups. And interactive verifiers, for instance, here I used the password one earlier. Um, I can say that me as a token creator has to approve every single claim. I can use location to say if someone is within a certain radius. Um, I can say upload a picture to uh, IPFS in that case, decentralized version of Dropbox. And then either the user decides who, to, who approves the picture or uh, I'm deciding who approves the picture. Um, yeah, the next two things, Sorcerer and external sources of value, I would postpone to another session. Um, it's a bit uh, too much at this point. I'm not gonna create that token now because it's gonna ask me for four transactions and then I would have to wait until they're all through. Um, but basically when that process is through, then something like this shows up here. Meanwhile, I can see that um, seven of you claimed and six of you were successful so far. Very good. 
Okay. Um, are there questions to the platform? Otherwise, I would um, go to the next step in the presentation. Um, you can also just ask by audio. Audio. You don't have to use the chat necessarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it does run on Ethereum on Rinkeby in that case. So here you can see Rinkeby. Uh, when I would change the network here, I can not interact with it anymore. Um, and I, when I tr ran Truffle Migrate, I ran Truffle Migrate Rinkeby. So it's there. And the transaction fees, everyone who uses the site has to pay. So it's always like this with every interaction, the user using it has to pay. Uh, on Rinkeby, that's not a big deal because it's all play money. Um, this is worth nothing in the real world. Um, but as soon as we would go transition to mainnet, um, of course, it's a question, do, do we want this? Do we want users to pay for doing good in the world? Or how do we solve this issue of, um, of gas fees? But as long as we're in Rinkeby, uh, it's safe. Okay. So, um, just to follow up on this comment, um, mm -hmm. this means that this whole um, website is running on the Ringby uh, network, not on the real Ethereum platform. Um, uh, yeah. The smart contracts were deployed to the Ringby network. Um, and I could talk to them with the command line like I did earlier with Truffle Console. But this sort of front end that I built, it's a React app that I will also show you in a bit more detail in the next session. And that React app is actually hosted right now on an Amazon instance that we have that's also owning this domain. Um, and that's what you load in your browser basically, but as with every interaction with the blockchain, um, you're going through MetaMask onto the Rinkeby network. That's basically how, how the division of, of logic is. Okay, thank you. All right. Then, and before I show you some, some code of the Fin4 project, just a quick overview of the technologies used, just the logos basically. So Ethereum logo, you've seen a few times already. Um, Solidity is the language that these smart contracts are written in. Um, we started using the Truffle framework for um, working with it. Nowadays, there would be cooler frameworks, I would say. Drizzle is the way the front end keeps the connection to the um, smart contracts. Ganache, you've seen, I used for development. IPFS um, could also be an input session in the next weeks. Um, it's the decentralized um, storage place, super interesting project. Um, yeah, it's a React app, this logo of React, and MetaMask is the browser extension that you've seen. And with that, I would go into the last demo of today and do a bit of a walkthrough of the code. I'm also opening my little script here, what I wanted to show you. Um, yeah, as earlier, it's hosted on future ICT on GitHub. Um, there, it's split in two repositories. The fin for explorer is the React front end and the fin for contracts are all the Solidity contracts that get deployed. And basically, I want to walk you through the journey to a claim that you all just did now with the um, presence token and actually show you the journey on what that means on, on a code level. All right. So I have my two repositories in there. Um, they're GitHub repositories. And where I want to start is in the contracts. Here you can see all the contracts. And we have a contract called Finform main. And um, so there's a lot of contracts that all have a play in what happens, but by design, we made it on purpose so that you only need one address. So the, the front end needs to know only one address of the Finform main, and that is enough to get the rest of them, right? Otherwise we would have to transport 10 addresses and be like, dear front end, use all of them. But we made it so that it's just one. Um, and this fin for main gets, where is that here? 
this you have seen earlier where I deployed this migrations contract and the demo contract. Um, here it's a bit more, yeah, it's just a bit more in here, but basically it's the same logic. We have the, the fin4 main and all the other ones. We deploy it and then on this fin4 main one, I'm calling the method set satellite addresses. And this um, basically stores all the other important contracts um, on the fin4 main one. And um, now to see how that lands in the front end, we're going into the front end and the React one. Um, a start point is app JSX, um, um, React app. I don't know who, if you worked with it, it's basically you're sort of wrapping these different components. So we have a, the, the router that makes like slash something and then you go to it theme, the drizzle one that keeps the connection um, all not so interesting. What I want to focus on is, um, so the, the top bar is the, oops, sorry. The element up here is the top bar and down here is the navigation bar. And in between, um, I'm reading out whatever it says in the menu items. And here we have all the, like home is if you don't put anything, slash tokens takes you to the tokens component, slash token slash create slash ID of the draft you're working on takes you to that one. So basically here, um, the whole routing issue is, um, is clarified. And um, in load initial data, I'm using it as a React component, but I'm also misusing it a bit because I'm returning now, meaning it doesn't render anything. I'm not interested in this component doing any rendering. What I'm interested in, is this component noticing when fin4 is loaded, fin4 main. Whenever that contract is loaded, we can do everything else. And in the drizzle config file, this is basically when I start up the front end, the only contract needs to be known from the beginning, as I said, is the fin4 main one. We have the abbey and we have the address and the address I'm taking from a file. So, um, this contract is known when the front end starts up, but then it sort of, it goes in and fetches, fetches the rest. So, um, yeah, fin4 main, when it's loaded, then we're setting a flag that we're only going in once here. So this will, so, and then adding the satellite contracts. And here we're adding all of these contracts. And then they're basically available in the um, in the front end. And from there, yeah, let's go into the navigation bar component. That's down here, home tokens claims. Um, we're using the same menu items, but we're filtering by those that have show enough bar true and you will see that um, showing enough bar true. That's just three, the home one, the tokens one, and the claim one, exactly. And from there, we can jump into the claim component. Um, so this is basically what you see here. So for instance, this is the submit button and the submit button um, calling this function. And you can see if, for instance, I don't have anything selected, I'm getting an error called token must be selected. Let's just see if that's true. Yep, token must be selected. But if a token is selected, we're doing a contract call. This method behind there, there's a lot of stuff going on. We don't need to go into detail. Basically, we're calling the method submit claim on the contract fin for claiming and we're giving the values that we have. Um, I will go to the fin for claiming contract, jumping into that other repository with the contracts. Um, yeah, we're in fin for claiming. And this is the method we're basically calling when we click the submit button through MetaMask and everything, but we will eventually end up here um, what happens here 
the first thing is that you actually forward this call. So what you can do within smart contracts is call other smart contracts. And by that, you can, then you can make a nice, clever software architecture, how, how, how it makes sense logically. So the first thing we do is we prepare these variables and then we call on the fin for token contract, the method submit claim. And that is because we decided some time ago that conceptually we want these claims to lie directly on the token. We could have also made a big repository with all the claims in one contract, but we decided it's um, more intuitive architecture if you claim a token that also the, literally the code of the claim is on that token. Um, so let's go into fin for token. And what we see here is that we don't find that function. And that is because fin for token is extending two contracts. If you know the object oriented concept, extending means I'm basically building on that code and extending it. And so I will have to look in fin for token base. And here we have the method submit claim. So we click that button, we got forwarded from fin for claiming to fin for token base and submit claim. And here we're creating a new um, claim object. By storage, we say, this is not just temporary. We want, we want this to be stored. And where do we store it? In the claims mapping. So mapping is basically, you put the integer in and you get the claim object uh, out of it. So we're creating a new claim object. Um, we're storing the time, which is now. Um, we put in the ID. Then all of these things, if it's a variable amount or a fixed amount that was the token creator set. Um, we're getting the required verifiers. So picture, password, or whatever. And um, we're initializing all of these verifiers on the claim with unsubmitted or there's basically the user has to submit. So it's in the current status unsubmitted. Uh, from the start, the claim is obviously uh, not approved, but it's also not rejected. Um, if there is, however, no verifiers, we immediately approve it because what else should we do with the claim? If there is no verifiers asked, we just approve it then. Um, yeah, then we increment the, the counter of how many claims are on this token and we return all of that stuff to the fin for claiming one. So it's, it's here. Um, here is a sort of a convenience mapping that we keep track on, on which tokens has a user claim. So we can do a bit more of a cheap search when we later need that info for, for the front end. And um, all of that stuff I would ignore for now, but the interesting part is we're emitting an event. The claim submitted event is something that smart contracts can, can do, can emit. And then front ends can subscribe to these kind of events. And we will find that really quickly if we just search for it. Um, yeah, here I registered the, uh, uh, the event when I added fin for claiming to, um, to Drizzle. And where we end up is here. So basically this is the code that gets executed when the front end hears the event claim submitted. And in my case, basically I'm also the one triggering that, but then it comes back to me through this event. And it, it feels like one continuous thing, but in the background it goes to uh, these two different contracts and then an event gets submitted. And then I'd be like, boom, your, your claim is there. Um, let me see, yeah. So here we're processing the claim a bit. If it's already there, it's a duplicate event that happens a lot. We're filtering that out. Um, we're teasing out the, the, the info we need to know, the quantity, the token. Um, and then we're dispatching it into the store. That's a concept called Redux store. That's a bit now too much detail maybe for React apps. But basically it's, it's one place where all of the different sites have access to because when I go to slash tokens or slash claims, basically a new website is rendered, right? But we need a place where all of these sites have access to. So the Redux store is this one place where all of the sites have access to. And um, let's see where that is. Um, here, basically I'm getting the claim object and I'm adding it to the so-called state variable users claim. Users claim is a bit more up here. And here we have all the um, values that we have available in the store in the sort of like the entire app can access whatever is in here. 
So users claim and in users claim, we just added a new claim and that will result in the claim. Um, if you remember, we were in earlier here when I showed you here's the submit button and uh, token must be selected and stuff. What's also in here is the component previous claims. That's basically this side here is the previous claim components. Let's go in there. And what we see down here is that this component is listening to whatever is happening in the store users claim. So whenever something happens with the users claim, uh, something happens here because it's, it's listening to that. And what that means is, um, so these are some safeguards. So please don't crash if you don't have any tokens available because there's this whole initializ initialization in the beginning, right? Um, that's why we need the safeguards. But if stuff is ready and available, we're going through these users claims um, one by one, that what's, what, the, what that map does. And for each, we're like teasing first out all the info we need, the claim, what's the token. Um, we need a link for the user to go to the proof site and then we're rendering that claim. So this is basically what you see here, the respective color, the different status. See each of these sort of um, elements is um, represented here as one claim. And then here, for instance, um, this sort of chip component shows the date, um, automatically changing when you change the language. Um, down here, it gets decided if the claim is rejected or um, um, or approved, then you make the color and stuff. Um, let's see. Yeah, basically that's the sort of walkthrough what happens from clicking on claiming a token and actually just seeing that the claim arrives. So that's a, there was that journey. Um, as you can imagine, there would be multiple more, more journeys I could sort of take you on, but I thought that would be a, um, a nice way of going in and out because you have, um, you have done it yourself before with the, with the presence token. Yeah, Nicholas. Uh, yes, hello. Just a short question. Like, assuming we would like to do something like this for our own project, like a very simplified version of this front end, what mm -hmm. would, we need? would we need like a private server to run this? Or how, how does this work? Um, so if you're so I can, I can run this whole thing locally. So instead of um, it being on demo.finfor.net where all of you can access this, I can, um, which I, I tried earlier, let's see. Um, so it, it basically runs on localhost 3000 and I can use the whole app and um, my blockchain will be Ganache. So that's the sort of the development setup to use. Um, only if you want to make it accessible to other people, you need to find a server. And even then you can use some tools like um, Ngrok, where you expose your local ports to the, to the world and then others can use it. See, so now we're running localhost. So none of, you, none of you can now access this. This is only running on my machine and I would switch from, ah, it is already. I'm not on Rinkeby, I'm on my local Ganache. And anything I do here will be super fast. So I can be like, um, hello. So I can click through here and I don't have to, um, I don't have to wait for the Rinkeby network to, to finish the transaction. It's gonna be super fast. So this is very important for, for developing that you can test your stuff quickly. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. So for developing, you you, you do it all locally. And um, as soon as you want it to be available wider, then you have to think about uh, a server. Yeah, that helped a lot. Thank you so much. Cool, perfect. Um, let's go back in here. Because the next part would basically be, um, since all of you will have to do coding in the next weeks, I thought I would list a few sort of boilerplates, like things to start from. Um, because 
And what we did back then, we started with the pet shop tutorial from Truffle um, because it was a really nice way to get into it. And from there we adapted it. So we used this sort of Truffle workflow. But honestly, I'm not sure if I would do it like that again, if I would start new, because nowadays there's um, from the same guy who did this ETH build, this Austin Griffith guy, he also has the scaffold ETH, a really nice sort of boilerplate to get going and the create ETH app and there's probably some more. So when you start with your team, um, you can think about what, what kind of boilerplate you use to start from. You can definitely use just ours because I will also be most comfortable in helping out with it because I know it uh, in and out if you use this truffle box stuff. Um, but if you wanna try the latest, you can also um, use one of the other ones. And um, just as a side note, this is um, Marcus's uh, crypto zombie, Beth. Um, so this is a nice tutorial, an interactive school that teaches you all things technical about blockchains, CryptoZombies.io. Uh, it's for free. You can click it through. It's quite entertaining and insightful. Um, okay, then I have a few more slides on um, sort of more um, content-wise. So let's talk a bit about smart contract security because it's a, it's a big deal. If you remember the fin for main contract that I showed you in the beginning, that's sort of one address that from there you can get all the others. Um, what you have or have not seen was this line here, require message sender is the fin for main creator because obviously this function set satellite address is quite crucial, right? If, if I would not make any safeguard here, anyone could call this method and just change our whole FIN4 system by deploying their own contracts and firing up here and we would have no control over it anymore. Um, it, well, no one has control over it, but it would be a, it would be a different system, not what we intended. Um, that's why require statements are important. So I basically say whoever deploys this FIN4 main contract, the first thing we do is we save this person message sender this account as fin for main creator and only that person um, is allowed to call this method but this is only halfway the security you need um, actually what you should do or what i should do um, is especially after telling you this is um, to make another sort of boolean or something that says and also it can only be called once by the creator in the beginning because as it is now if I deployed my nice demo.finfer.net and then somehow I become evil at a later point and I'd be like, ha ha ha, now I'm changing it because I have the account and this method is not safeguarding me against it. So I'm trying to highlight basically with smart contract security, there's a, there's a spectrum of either you keep it all open or you block out certain things or you go all the way and also think about um, basically people knowing how to read these contracts, they will look at it and be like, well, Benjamin, that's a really nice contract, but I see a loophole. But you're basically empowering yourself to change this later on. That's not cool. That's not in the spirit of Fin4. Please, um, I don't believe in the project anymore, right? So these things are very crucial to think about with uh, smart contract security. Um, here is the top 10 common security issues from, um, from this website down there. Um, and then if you're big company and you, you can you can you have some money then you should definitely hire an auditing firm for your security audits chain security for instance is a spin-off from eth zurich um, consensus diligence and open zeppelin security are big players in the space um, yeah and also the mempool thing we had earlier all of these things go into smart contract security and if i may that's a business model because pwc switzerland the accounting and consultancy company just bought chain security recently. So yeah. it's a business and I think you understand why. Yeah, it's a, it's a quite a big business, a tendency growing rapidly. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, let's talk a bit about um, tokens on Ethereum. Uh, anyone can create new kinds of assets and trade them on Ethereum. These are known as tokens. People have tokenized traditional currencies, their real estate, their art, and even themselves. Um, this is what you have seen with, with our tokens that we create on the platform. Um, other popular types of tokens are stable coins that try to um, stay as close to the dollar or the euro as possible. Then there are governance tokens that we will hopefully talk in a later session about these TCR mechanisms. 
Um, the notion of shit coins has established itself for um, people doing bad stuff with tokens that are not properly done. Um, collectible tokens, um, keyword uh, crypto kitties, so stuff you collect. And as you can see with that variety, it really makes sense to have standards. And this is exactly what the community did because there are no rules what a smart card can or cannot do. It's a, it's a Turing complete language. You can do a lot of it with it, um, but you still want to um, deploy some standards for documenting how a country can interoperate with other contracts. Um, ERC-20 is the most widespread token standard for fungible assets. I'm going to go into that in a, in a second. And it has achieved near complete industry adoption and ignited the whole eco wave, initial coin offering wave. Um, and it's also what we're using in FIN4. We're building on the ERC-20 um, token standard. Another one is the ERC-721, the de facto solution for non-fungible tokens, often used for collectible and games. And fungibility in a nutshell basically means in fungible assets, so your bank account statement, it matters how much you have. Whereas in non-fungibles, like your house, you care about which ones you have. Or in this graphic, you can also see fungible. They all look the same. It doesn't matter. You just want to have a lot of them, basically. But with non-fungible, it matters. The individual matters. They have a different look, different shape, or they're crypto kitties. And um, this is the interface of the ERC-20 token from Open Zeppelin that we're building on top with the tokens we create. And it basically defines a few um, functions that any smart contract that has these functions can call themselves an ERC-20 token, basically. Um, you need to be able to ask for the total supply, how much of this token is in circulation. If you give it a, a concrete person, a concrete address, you get their balance back. You need to be able to transfer it. You need to allow um, certain addresses to spend in your name. That's also an important function for working with, uh, with smart contracts that you allow them to sort of take money from you. Then it's much more convenient than you having to send it. You just allow it basically. Um, yeah, and then there's two events that a transfer happened or that an approval happened. Uh, approval and allowance are connected that you basically approve this transfer. Yes, um, so much to the standards. Now, I think we're doing okay with time with the very last uh, chapter, just three more slides on this. Uh, the Internet of Things, of course, in itself would be a full-blown lecture and much more huge topic. Um, I just want to sort of tease it a bit from the FIN4 perspective. So the Internet of Things describes the network of physical objects, things that are embedded with sensors, software, and other technologies for the purpose of connecting and exchanging data with other devices and systems over the internet. Um, an important concept in that is oracles. Oracles are a data feed that connect Ethereum to off-chain real-world information so you can query data in your smart contracts. Because basically everything in the Ethereum world is 100% deterministic. Before you make a transaction, you know exactly what's going to happen. That's also why gas prices can be calculated and stuff. But how do you get messy real world data in? If you want to know who won the soccer game or you want to know the stock price of something, how do you get that in? And the answer is um, oracles. And to, to show a concrete example, what we um, did or tried out is how can we realize how can we basically, the use case, someone is watering my plants while I'm on holiday and I want them to be automatically rewarded with tokens for doing so. One way of doing it is they submit a photo. This is me on the um, social innovation week uh, last year on stage where I watered the plant and I submitted the proof by doing a picture. That's of course a bit lame because it's not automatic. I have to submit it and anyone can fake a picture. I can send it later. I can Photoshop it. I can send it three times or whatever. So what we actually want is um, a sensor. In this case, a humidity sensor connected with a Raspberry Pi. Um, no, Arduino, sorry. And then you can see here that was in, in November where this bit of an ugly plant, I put it in and then I watered it and then um, I got a token minted. And in the next step, I would, this is the slide that's really the sort of the fullest, but I, it will build up step by step and I hope it's useful. I want to basically walk you through what happens from watering the plant to actually receiving the token. Um, yeah, this is the good way to do it. 
So we start with a sensor and we're watering it. And so, no, let's start like this. So this is the fin for sensors repository on future ICT. The language uh, programming language is processing. And um, what you see here, the if statement um, is something that um, Magnus and Kusai came up with as a way to say, if the average values from this sensor are spiking out of the average, that means something changed. And if it changed towards more humidity, it means it was watered. So basically, if this if statement is triggered, that's um, we're saying, okay, watering has happened. And what do we do? We call a method that that um, basically sets off an HTTP request to this address, um, fin for oracle engine.ngrog. Ngrog is this thing how I can expose my stuff locally to the web slash sensor. And then I'm encoding parameters, the idea of the sensor and some data. The plus plant says, thank you for watering. So we're sending this off, yeah. And um, where it lands is in um, the fin for Oracle engine repository written in the programming language Node.js. And there uh, basically a little server is listening to any posts happening to slash sensor, um, which is exactly what we're targeting here. Um, so the request arrives here. We're teasing out the sensor idea. We're also getting a timestamp of the current time and we're getting the data out and we're calling um, call fin for Oracle hab is the function. It's a bit longer here, but I'm, that part below is just sort of basically technically how does that call to the blockchain happen? But the, the, the logical part up here is what we want. So basically the contract, we're calling the method, the fin for Oracle hub contract, we're calling the receive sensor signal method with these parameters. And where this lands finally, is in the fin for contracts repository with the solidity contracts that I showed you earlier. And there we have a contract called fin for Oracle hub with a method receive sensor signal. And what that does is basically it makes a loop over all the subscribers. So all the contracts who previously registered their interest in whatever the sensor has to say, they're getting notified now, right? That's the um, sender receiver um, pattern. Um, so basically it sends out um, sensor signal received to all the subscriber listening. And this lands in a contract called sensor one time signal, extending the verifier type. So the password you saw earlier is a verifier type, the allowing only one claim is a verifier type, uploading a picture. These are all verifier types. And this one is built to listen to um, whatever the fin for Oracle hub has to say. And the fin for Oracle hub is basically the one um, receiving signals from outside. And yeah, basically the, the slide is full. I don't wanna, there's of course some more steps now until the user actually gets their token. But from then on, you kind of have seen it a bit earlier with the claim process. So here I would just cut it and say, the end result is that the person who watered the plant um, gets one water the plant token. Yeah, that's um, that's a work walkthrough of how we envision this um, a little IoT example with Fin4. There would be definitely other ways to sort of do the whole architecture, but um, we wanted it to be um, sort of future proof. The Oracle engine will have other tasks in the future, and um, yeah, but there's there's other ways to do it. Okay, bibliography. I'm I have some books listed here and some online resources listed. Um, you will get the slides afterwards. And then there's questions.